Douglas Warren Scanlon, my colleague at UC Berkeley, as it happens. Tom is a logician. Berkeley has a, a large group of log in logic as well. And Tom's interest is in particular in applications of logic to uh, algebra. And that's what we're going to hear about, something in algebraic geometry. This uh, rather fantastic notion that you can avoid analysis when doing Hodge theory, or at least partly avoid it. So Tom got his PhD in 1997 under Ehud Rushkovsky at Harvard, and he's one of my favorite speakers. So let me turn it over to Tom. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I, I hope that uh, I can live up to, uh, to your hopes today's talk. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be showing you can really avoid analysis, but rather I think what I'm I'll try to try to show is that you can do analysis, you can do uh, do geometry using intuitions and ideas from geometry, using the way that we the way that we uh, we tend to understand how we do mathematics when we just write it down and draw pictures, as opposed to working with the most general possible form of form of analysis. Uh, let me just start the uh, start the presentation then. I hope that's visible for all of you. Uh, this is not the first time that David asked me to give one of these uh, one of these talks. In fact, not the first time he asked me to talk about this topic. Uh, so a little over ten years ago, well, it's eleven years ago, uh, I spoke about ohmonormality as it was applied to diaphragm and geometry uh, at the joint math meeting in New Orleans, and I have to say that at the time, and uh, well, I still find it surprising, but at the time, I found it very surprising that we could use these methods from mathematical logic, not just any methods from mathematical logic, but these methods that have to do with real geometry and sort of extending real semi algebraic geometry to an abstract context to say something truly meaningful about numbers and about diaphragm and geometry, but it worked. <laughs> it's, it, actually, it actually does make sense. Uh, at that time, there were a number of applications, but I'll, I'll just highlight three of the, the highlights that uh, they talked about then, and that still have ramifications now and to the kinds of topics that we'll be discussing today. So the first paper that really had an impact on the subject uh, was the work by Jonathan Pilaw and Alex Wilkie, in which they proved a counting theorem for rational points and definable sets in ominal structures on the real numbers. Now, uh, what I mean by definable set and ominal structure, I'm going to explain that. So let's, let's just bracket that to the side right now. Uh, but the counting part of it has to do more with seeing how many rational points do you have if you were say, to order them by their height. So the height of a rational number is the maximum of the size of its numerator or its denominator if you write it in lowest terms. Let's, let's set the height of zero to be zero. So if you bound the height inside of the, the height of a tuple of rational numbers in, in space to be at most some number t, well, there are only finite many numbers you have, something on the order of uh, like n plus one to the, to the t, many rational numbers that might have to, it, 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 I mean, t to the n plus one, that you might have to worry about. Well, so you can count how many there, there might be. And what they showed was that provided that you eliminate those subsets which just come from algebra, those which might naturally be expected to have many rational points, uh, then there's a small number, where small means bounded by any polynomial in the, in the height bound. Really a fantastic theorem and something which, as I said, at first glance doesn't seem to fit into this, into this theory because it's really a theory about real surfaces, about real geometry. And you're comparing it to something in arithmetic, which has a very different character, but, uh, but it worked. Now, shortly after they proved this theorem, Umberto Zanier observed that there ought to be a way to use these kinds of bounds to prove a non-trivial 
non-trivial results in Diophantine geometry. And what I mean by that is that you should be able to somehow describe the possible algebraic relations on arithmetically interesting sets by appealing to this kind of counting principle. And as a proof of concept, he and, and Jonathan Pilaf proved or reproved the Madame Mumford conjecture. So the Madame Mumford conjecture uh, has been proven, I know of at least a half dozen proofs of different characters that have occurred over the years. Uh, the first one was a piatic proof done by Reynaud. Uh, says that if you take a subvariety of an abelian variety, so uh, complex torus, which is defined, which has the structure of an algebraic variety, take a subvariety of an abelian variety, which is itself irreducible and contains a dense set of torsion points. So points in the abelian variety which satisfy an equation the form n times x equals zero, then that subvariety has to itself basically be a group. So it has to be a translate of an abelian subvariety sub by a torsion point. So it, gives the, it says that the only way you can have many solutions to this kind of a Diophantian problem is for the equation itself to define something which comes from a group. Right? So it's an interesting theorem on its own, but it was really a proof of concept for using omonimal methods in order to solve problems in Diophantian geometry. And then there was this spectacular result by Jonathan Pilar, where he solved for the first time unconditionally, so without you know, previous kinds of work, previous work on this problem had assumed the generalized Riemann hypothesis or other strong hypotheses of a, of a transcendental number theoretic nature to prove the Andre Or conjecture. Now, the Andre Or conjecture is not going to be the main point of this talk, so I, I won't go into what else, uh, what else involved, other, other than to say that this was the result that we, well, Yes, any results. I mean, mathematics, you don't expect that the results are going to happen until they're proven. But this is a proof that I think was really, really fantastic. Now, on this page, what I'm showing is uh, the math review uh, written by Sasha Slopentok uh, for the original Pilar Wilkie theorem. And I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. First, I just think this is really a nicely done review. And it's it shows in very clearly what it is that they that they proved. Yeah, so she explains exactly what's meant by an omnimal structure. Again, I'm going to go over this in more detail. And if your screen is not big enough for you to read what's written there, don't worry. I'm going to I'm going to explain what's really meant by an omnimal structure. But she also clearly explains what's what it is that they're counting. So how you bound the heights of the numbers, how you remove the algebraic parts, and then what's left to count. And they Give this explicit upper bound that's the number of rational points of heights at most t instead of the transcendental part of a definable set is going to be at most some constant times t to the power to the power epsilon. You give these kinds of bounds. But the other reason why I wanted to, to point this out, as you can see again if your screen is, is big enough so that it's so that it's visible to you, that's the this theorem has been cited already as represented in MathSciNet, and as, as we know, it takes a while before these, before these citations tend to appear in MathSciNet. It appears 111 times. And many of these citations are from quite recent papers that appear in very prestigious journals. This work continues to have, continues to have impact. And the kinds of ramifications of that work are manifold. I'm going to mention just a few, right? So I'd like to just point out two very striking new works in this line of research from what I talked about 11 years ago. Uh, one having to do with the Ork conjecture, another one having to do with this counting theorem itself. And then I'd like to focus most of the rest of the discussion about how it's been used, how these ideas have been used in Hodge theory. All right, so the first major advance, recent advance that I just mentioned without going into much detail, uh, is that the Andre Or conjecture was not totally solved by Jonathan Pilar in his work on modular curves. He's, 
he solved a special case, an important special case, but a special case. And over the years, the methods that were introduced to solve the problem there have been refined and bits and pieces of it have successively fallen. It was only this past October that the full conjecture was completely resolved. And this uh, appears in a paper by, uh, by, by Jonathan Bilal, uh, Shankar and Zimmerman, where they completely resolve the Andre conjecture for all Shimmer varieties, pure and, and mixed. The second major advance in this subject, which uh, and we've been hoping for it, but hope, you know, hope, is, hope springs eternal, was that there is actually a much better bound on the possible, uh, on the number of rational points that you might have in definable sets, if you restrict where they're defined. Now, in the original theorem of Pillar and Wilkie, it was uh, shown that you have this bound of the number of rational points is bounded by constant times t to a power. And uh, examples were adduced showing that that's the best you can do, at least in complete generality. You can use some kind of lacunary power series in order to produce examples of definable sets which come from uh, subanalytic geometry where any improvement on that quality of the bounds just fails. But this is somewhat artificial, They're kind of like uh, Louisville functions, uh, which of course are real functions, are real analytic functions, but they're not the kinds of functions that you're going to see in applications. And what uh, Alex Wilkie suggested was that if you restrict the kinds of functions you allow in the definition of these sets, then you should have much stronger bounds. And in particular, if the kinds of functions that you allow are only those you can define using the real exponential function and then compositions of that and projections and so on, then the quality of the bound should look like a polynomial in the logarithm of the height. And uh, some cases of this have been shown over the years, but cases say for curves in three space or surfaces in three space, it's, it's been hard to achieve substantial results towards this, towards this, uh, towards this theorem. But this is uh, exactly what has been, has been done uh, in the work of uh, Benjamin, Novikov, and Zach, where they prove a sharpened version of the covering lemma, uh, which is used in, in uh, proving the counting theorem, uh, by introducing a uh, notion of degree into a minimality. And using that, they completely resolve uh, Wilkie's conjecture. So in those first two, first two theorems, I think they're amazing theorems, amazing papers. They deserve uh, current events bullets and talks of their own, but I'm gonna put them to the side. And instead, what I'm going to focus on now is the work on Hodge theory, uh, which appears in a number of works. I'm going to talk about the theorems appearing in two papers. Uh, so there's a paper by Ben Bakker and Jacob Zimmerman, where they prove a result in functional transcendence for period mappings associated the variation of odd structures. Uh, if that doesn't make sense to you what that is, don't worry. It didn't make sense to me either when I first heard about what the theorem was. Uh, so I'll explain. I'll explain what these, uh, what that's, what the period mappings are and what the, uh, what the functional transcendence theorem is that they prove. And uh, a second paper uh, where they're joined also by Bruno Klingler, uh, where they prove further definability results, uh, having strong consequences towards certain consequences of the Hodge conjecture. So they don't prove the Hodge conjecture. I'm not claiming that anybody knows how to do that yet, but they do make, uh, they do resolve some important consequences. Right, so there are a number of other papers in this line of work. Uh, I'm going to totally ignore them today, not because they're not interesting and not important, but because, well, first off, there's only so much that I understand. And secondly, we only have so much time. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to overdo it. Uh, 
if you do want to know more, well, you can read the papers. The papers are written nicely. But better than that, there are some really nice expository papers and lecture videos that are available to you. Uh, so a couple of the authors, uh, Ben Bacher and uh, Jacob Zimmerman wrote a 70 page expository paper uh, called Lectures on the Action Well Conjecture, where they explain basically everything around this, around the around Axe-Janual, which is the functional transcendence theorem that I, that I mentioned, and in particular, how it relates to variations of power structure. It's done very nicely. It's a very clean place to read about, uh, about all of this. Uh, there are lecture series available on YouTube. Uh, so I've pulled screenshots of two of those. Uh, the one that Jacob is giving, I think is not done yet. So he's giving a series of lectures at the Fields Institutes. Uh, there are five or six of them already done, posted on YouTube, and you can start watching those. I think he's going to do, do a few more. And uh, Bernard Klingler also has a, a nice four lecture series of, uh, of talks about these theorems. They go into much more detail to explain the motivations. Uh, I highly recommend that if you want to follow this topic that you, you that you follow up by, by looking at some of these. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a step back and I'd like to say a little something about where where the idea for uh, really using ominimality comes from, or at least how ominimality might fit in to this general algebraic algebraic geometric picture, uh, and. This is not, it's not actually the case that Grothendieck's ideas uh, about uh, tame topology directly influenced the, uh, the discovery and initial development of ominimality, but they're consonant. And it was recognized fairly quickly. So within you know, less than a decade after Grothendieck raised this, uh, proposed his, his program, that ominimality really could serve as the, uh, as the framework for instantiating in a real way what Grothendieck is asking for. Right, so what I'm showing here on the, on the screen are it's a bit of text that I've, I've pulled from his uh, CNRS application. Uh, I don't expect that. No. Again, if you have a big, huge screen, maybe you can you can read what's uh, you can you can read some of it. Uh, this text you can find I, if you prefer it in the French version or the English version. You can find it at the Growth Index Circle site, uh, where it's been retranscribed into into light text, so it's easy, it's a bit easier to read. Uh, there are many exciting ideas in this uh, in this document, but the one that I'm going to focus on is the idea about tame topology. Or Topology Motoré. And what's, uh, what Grotendieck observes is that when we do geometry, our intuitions are coming from geometry. We develop some notions of topology and of associated structures for the purpose of seeing these shapes and understanding properties of these shapes. And that's that was true already when you were doing Euclidean geometry. And here I've uh, pulled a page from a 19th century book by Bern, where he, uh, he actually tries to do Euclidean geometry with pictures. And you can do that. I mean, that's, that's, how we understand, that's how we understand geometry. But it continues even when we move into the calculus. So the, at least, you know, here I've, I've also just taken a, a picture that I pulled out of a textbook on calculus. The kinds of graphs that we that we draw for our, our students in our first year calculus class, the way that we we think about integrals, are their pictures, right? It's, you know, it might not be that every function is continuous, but the discontinuities aren't that bad. It might not be the case that every function is is uh, always increasing or differentiable, but the places where you have discontinuities, or the places where it's not differentiable or where it might change direction, there aren't so many of them. You can draw it. And it's something that can make, that can make sense. We actually do that work in calculus 
using our geometric intuitions. But we learn that's, that's somehow not right because many of the operations that we might want to uh, employ in order to really put calculus and analysis in a firm foundation force us to deal with pathologies. And that introduction of general topology ne necessitates those pathologies. Uh, you know, you can see in that in the in the fragment of the text that they copied from Grotendieck, that uh, he, he observes that these that these topology that these pathologies are all around us. And uh, I just like to quote from what he says about the space filling curves. He says that even now, just as in heroic times when one anxiously witnessed for the first time curves cheerfully filling squares and cubes. When one tries to do topological geometry in the technical context of topological spaces, one is confronted at each step with spurious difficulties related to wild phenomena. And what he searches for is some way to do topology, to do geometry, even if it's the most abstruse form of algebraic, of algebraic geometry, do it so that we're still at the level of our geometric intuitions. And what he suggested might be place where this could be done would be semi-analytic geometry kind of in the way that is done by Hiranaka. And uh, what Lau Vandendries suggested in his book, Tame Topology and Ominimal Structures, is that really a possible instantiation of this would be ominimality. And uh, yeah, so I, I find what's, uh, what Lau says in his preface here, uh, no, it's, it's too modest. Okay, so he, he suggests here, this is a book that was published in 1998. So he, he wrote this some years earlier. Uh, he says that this connection between omino structures and topology motore is hardly controversial. Now, the reason why I think it was hardly controversial is that the next line that he writes is also true. That's it's not widely known or understood. Nobody had really seen that there are very few people other than Lau had seen that's really the right way to kind of think about tame topology was in terms of ominimality. And so this, this suggestion that this was hardly controversial or that really ominimality might be the right place for tame topology was, uh, well, maybe ahead of its time. But the work over the past quarter century really borne out this insight. Ominimality, which really arises as just the study of definable sets and certain structures and the real numbers, can and does play the role of Grotendieck's tame topology. Okay, so I'm going to offer two, okay, two equivalent definitions of what it means to be an ominimal structure. One, which will make you happy if you, if you like uh, first sort of logic, and the second one, which is supposed to look better if you want to think about a structure as something which is something like a topological space. They're equivalent, they're the same, they're really the, really the same notion. But uh, let me just say the two ways you might, might want to think about it. So the first way to think about what an ominous structure on the real numbers is, is that you start with the real numbers thought of as an ordered field, and then you give yourself some additional collection of functions in several, variables possibly, so not just one variable, you might have two variable functions, three variable functions uh, that you regard as your distinguished functions. So from the point of view of first order logic, I'm treating those functions as instantiations of some function symbols in whatever new language that we're, that we're introducing. And to say that the structure is O minimal is just to say that if you look at the definable sets in one variable, even using parameters, you just get points and intervals or finite unions of those. Okay, so that's the logician's way of thinking about an ominous structure is. If you want something which looks more like uh, what you might say a topological space is or some other kind of a some other kind of a structure is, instead of talking about building up all the definable sets by starting with a function and then seeing what the language produces for you, you just give yourself the collection of all the definable sets as the structure. So the definable sets are those sets which live as new distinguished sets in my structure, all these S's. So I have some sets 
some subsets of the line that's S1. I call those definable. I have some subsets of S2 that are called, called definable. So for instance, the, the graph of uh, multiplication by five, right? There's going to be a, a definable set that, that appears in, in S2 and so on. And for this to be a structure, you need to make some requirements as to what happens with these classes of definable sets. They should be closed under the natural operations, say Boolean operations, projection from one, you know, from n plus one space to n space, uh, permutation of the coordinates, and so on. You know, so there's some other things you need to add just to make sure that it's it has the right closure properties. But to say that this structure is O minimal is just to say that those sets that are definable in dimension one, that is the class S1, is exactly the collection of sets that are finite unions of singletons and open intervals. Okay, so that's an O-minimal structure. I prefer the first presentation because that's how you actually think about building these things. You know, so you, you have some new functions and then, well, you can use those functions to define inequalities and that gives you new definable sets and so on. But uh, if you just want to see it all at once, not think too much about the first row logic, then you can go to the second presentation. Uh, there are a number of examples of uh, ominous structures. Uh, the first one, which is itself very important, uh, is just the structure of semi-algebraic geometry. That is, you consider the reals and the definable sets are those sets that you can define using polynomial inequalities. That's it, okay? Uh, it's a theorem of Tarski that this is ominous. That's not the way that he phrased it, but he proved a quantified elimination theorem in 1929. Uh, for the real numbers from which he deduced the uh, decidability of Euclidean geometry uh, and it implies open minimality of structure. You can give yourself also the exponential functions. This is Wilkie's theorem. That stays open minimal. We can add functions that you use for local or semi-local real analytic geometry and that's open minimal. And what we're doing here is I'm not giving you every analytic function but just analytic functions restricted to compact boxes. So the sine function, for instance, is not allowed. And you can see it's not allowed because if the sine function, if you look at, say, the set of zeros, the sine function, that would give you a set which cannot, you know, the infinite discrete set cannot be expressed as a finite unit of points and intervals. That's not allowed. But if you take the sine function and you restrict it to a closed interval between, say, negative 10 and 10, that's fine. That would be an allowed function in this, in this structure. And the structure which is used in almost every application I'm going to describe uh, is called RNX. That's where you allow all of these restricted analytic functions and the global real exponential function. And this turns out to be a very robust uh, ominous structure in which we can define many sets that actually appear in geometric problems. There are other examples, but uh, maybe I won't go into those now. All right, so let me just mention some theorems that are true about general minimal structures, which show that it really behaves tamely, all right? Uh, one of the first theorems is that every definable function is piecewise continuous. In fact, it's piecewise differentiable, where piecewise means at all but final many points. In fact, it's piecewise strictly monotone and differentiable, meaning that you can find find many points, so you where things might go wrong, but between those points, the function is going to be continuous, differentiable, and always increasing, always decreasing, or constant. Uh, limits always exist, where all right, my limit might be minus infinity or plus infinity, but if you accept that, limits always exist. I never have this funny oscillation, which or some kind of situation where you have limits along one subsequence, but not another, uh, along another one. You always get limits for functions of uh, one variable functions. Uh, the class of definable sets is closed under the natural topological operations. You know, if a set is definable, so is its closure, so is its interior, so is its boundary. We don't need to use the axiom of choice. Every Continue, or every definable surjective function has a definable right inverse. Uh, we also have this nice property that 
definable countable sets are finite. So that's, you can often use the, this is often a very useful principle that you can somehow test for finiteness just by looking for discreteness or by looking for countability. Uh, the fundamental theorem of O-minimality, the cell decomposition theorem, uh, which we're not, not gonna appear on the surface of anything I'm gonna talk about today, but it's one of the most important results and it's what really underlies everything else that you do with O-minimality. It's what makes o structures tame. And I'd say, interestingly, uh, before Grotendieck starts to explain why it is that he really needs to have sort of this tame topology, he explains that what he finds especially interesting and especially valuable in studying different kinds of spaces is stratification. So you might take a, say an algebraic variety and stratify it by looking at singular locus and a singular locus, other singular locus and so on. And that's, it's important that each one of these strata is itself a nice kind of space, maybe a nicer kind of space than you have at the top. The cell decomposition theorem is somehow the quintessential stratification theorem. And it's what's used to prove more refined stratification theorems in all the different applications of O-minimality. All right, so let me just quickly tell you what the cell decomposition theorem says. Uh, first, you have to define what a cell is. And you define cells inductively, where on the line, a cell is just a point, or it's an open interval. And then when you go from in space to in plus one space, you might have a cell in in space and a continuous definable function on that cell, it's graph. It's now a cell in n plus one space. Whereas if you have two continuous functions and they're separated, the interval between them is a cell. And then you can also go to infinity or to minus infinity. The cell decomposition theorem just says that whenever you take any definable set, you can cut up the ambient space into finite many cells so that that set can be built up out of, out of those. Um, so here's a very badly drawn picture of a definable set uh, that you might cell decompose. And the idea is that to do the cell decomposition, you just look at the boundaries of the set on each horizontal line and that will define piecewise continuous functions. And then you just find the cells as those things in between those, either the graphs or the things in between, right? And that's the idea. And okay, that's not a complete proof, but it's an idea of, of how that works. Now, the really impressive application or the improvements in O-minimality that uh, was achieved, oh, about 12 years ago by uh, Kobe Peterzel and Sergei Starchenko was to apply O-minimality to complex analysis, which might seem wrong from a level because of course the whole idea of O-minimality is that it has to do with the order, the order on the real numbers, that's where the O comes from. Uh, but you know, you can do, you can do, sorry, you, you can do complex analysis by relating it back to the real, just by do, using real and imaginary parts. So that's, that's what they do. And in thinking about that, and thinking about the way that you can, you can uh, relate complex analysis to the, to the reals, uh, they proved a great many uh, regularity theorems about definable complex analytic functions or definable complex analytic sets. And the one that we're going to be using goes under the name of the definable Chow theorem, uh, which says that if you take a subset of C to the N, which is simultaneously complex analytic, so it's defined locally by the vanishing of complex analytic functions and is definable in the sense of our omino structure, the only way that can happen is if it's actually an algebraic set. So there are no essential singularities in definable complex analytic sets. Now, uh, let me just, as an aside, just say like, what's going on and as to how they, how they came to this and why they came to it. So their motivation wasn't 
to prove some kind of application to some interesting theorem in geometry. No, their, their motivation was to see to what extent could you develop complex analysis in general ominal structures. Now I've defined ominality as living on the real numbers, but it could also make sense to do it on non-standard copies of the real numbers where you don't have available to you the integration three along curves or something that you might usually use in order to, to build up uh, complex analysis. And they wanted to see to what extent could you actually just do complex analysis in ominal, uh, ominal structures and it worked out. Uh, but in the course of doing that, they found that these results which apply directly to honest complex analytic sets. Now, this idea is suggestive that it should have something to do with the Hodge conjecture. Now, like I said, I'm not suggesting, I don't want you to, to think that I'm saying that anybody has any idea how to prove the Hodge conjecture by applying these ideas from, uh, from ominimality. But uh, it's, there are suggestive connections, right? So what I've copied here is the uh, description of the Hodge conjecture on the Clay Mathematics Institute's page uh, for the Millennium Problems. It's uh, kind of vague, uh, but even though it's not so mathematically precise in the way that it's stated here in this, uh, this one paragraph, it's, it's very suggestive. And it, it suggests that it's some kind of connection to the idea of team topology. So they say, unfortunately, the geometric origins of the procedure, and here the procedure is computing the cohomology of an algebraic variety, became obscured in generalization. In some sense, it was necessary to add pieces that did not have any geometric interpretation. Of course, the Hodge conjecture says that well, those pieces should have a geometric interpretation. So let me explain how this, how the Hodge conjecture and some consequences of it are really related to related to ominimality. But to do that, I want to step back and actually talk a bit about the about this geometric the geometric origin of those procedures in Hodge theory. And to me, the origin starts with uh, Georges Durand's thesis in which he proves the comparison theorem between singular cohomology and what we now call Durand cohomology. That is cohomology, which is computed using the, uh, using differential forms. So the, uh, the theorem uh, expressed in more modern language and by modern, I don't mean English. I mean, so the, the issue isn't the French versus English, but in more modern language that what he's, he's proven is that there's a natural isomorphism between the singular cohomology of a manifold, say with real coefficients, and its Durand cohomology. And moreover, that the singular cohomology you can compute using smooth, uh, using smooth chains, right? So that it makes sense to integrate over them. Now he expresses this in terms of uh, an equality of numbers of uh, the Betty numbers, and which is a dimension of the Betty cohomology and the uh, dimensions of other cohomology groups that you might compute using, using differential forms. But what he really proves is he really does prove this, uh, this isomorphism between the cohomology groups. Just after that, you get to the, the, uh, the work of Hodge, provides the decomposition of the cohomology because of course you can do the decomposition at the level of differential forms, uh, which then you know it uses harmonic analysis in a serious uses harmonic analysis in a serious way, but uh, but it's, it seems to have an algebraic origin. So what is it that that's, uh, that you have in the Hodge decomposition? So you can you can take the differential forms on a complex manifold, and locally. You can, you know, if you want to think about this complex manifold now, say it's a real manifold. So if you had, say, complex coordinates z1 through z, what did I write here, z uh, d. Uh, well, you could look at the conjugates, the two together. You could use you could use to give uh, to give coordinates on the on the whole manifold, and you could break up the differential forms into their pq parts. So those parts where you have p differentials of the, of the uh, 
of the holomorphic coordinates and Q of the anti holomorphic coordinates. Right? Now, that works locally. But what Hodge showed is that using methods of uh, harmonic analysis, that actually this persists to the level of the cohomology, you know, provided we're working with a compact space. Right? Now, that decomposition uh, enjoys some very nice properties. For instance, you hear of them working on the algebraic variety. When you swap P and Q, that's the same as taking the, the complex conjugates of the of the spaces. Uh, it has some nice properties with respect to some inner products, but I'm going to ignore that because you know, it takes too too long to talk about. But it has some nice it has some nice properties. And uh, in that decomposition, there are certain classes which come from geometry, and the nicest ones are those which come from the cycle class map. So if you have a sub variety, that's going to define for you certain classes in cohomology which again, I'm not going to go into how you compute the cycle class, but it's, it's too much to be motivated. But it gives you an element which lives inside of cohomology. So if you have a sub variety of co-dimension P, it's going to give you a class in cohomology, you know, the two P dimensional cohomology, but which is the PP class, right? And class is integral. So remember that it's actually coming from something which is like an honest, uh, in, in on a cycle, so it's you don't have to go to the reals to see it. So we call these the integral Hodge classes. We do with Q, we call those the the, uh, the rational Hodge classes. And the Hodge conjecture is that every Hodge class, every rational Hodge class, comes from a rational linear combination of these cycles. Okay, that's a conjecture. It's not. Okay, we're not going to prove it. Grodendieck wrote a paper in English. Uh, saying that Hodge's general conjecture is false for trivial reasons. It's not actually, he's not actually showing that that form is false. He meant some generalization. But in that, in that paper, he suggested two consequences of the Hodge conjecture, which you might be able to prove and which would be interesting to study. I'm just going to talk about the second one, which is that, says, he says that the, basically that the, what we call the Hodge locus would have to be algebraic. So let me tell you what this comes from. So this comes from the notion of a geometric variation of Hodge structures. And the construction is, uh, no, I'll tell you the construction. And there, there are parts in the construction which I'm not going to go into because again, we don't have a whole lot of time, but the construction itself is geometric. And the idea is that if you have a family of algebraic varieties, you can think about it as a family of manifolds. So it's to be a smooth family, I want the map to be smooth, all the varieties to be smooth, base to be smooth. You can think of it as a family of manifolds and topologically, it's trivial. So topologically, if you work locally, all of the varieties look the same. They're all, the, they're all homeomorphic manifolds, which means that using, using that trivialization, that their cohomologies all look the same. Okay, that's wonderful. The cohomologies look the same, but the Hodge decompositions do not, because the Hodge decomposition depends upon the complex structure. And the trivialization is just a topological thing. Right? So you don't see the same Hodge structures. Now that might be a problem, but rather than thinking of it as a problem, you think of it as really giving you a way to measure the variation of the complex structure in this family. And that's where the notion of a variation of Hodge structure comes from. Right? So there's a way of well, giving this, the, the, uh, the space of all of the Hodge structures on the given reference point, uh, the structure of a complex manifold. And in doing so, you can see that the map which takes a point to its corresponding Hodge structure will be an analytic map. Now this is, I'm suppressing a lot. This is the serious work of Philip Griffiths in order to show that that map is, uh, is analytic. You have to be careful about how you actually define the analytic structure on D, but it can be done. And after you've done that, since you've, and you mod out by the action of the fundamental group, you get the global uh, mapping, that's called the global period mapping. That's the thing that we're going to, that we're going to look at. And 
the beautiful theorem of Gawker, Klingler, and Zimmerman is that these period mappings are definable. And what they, they show, and so there are, there are three parts to their theorem. First part is that the period spaces, these spaces we get that parameterize all the Hodge structures, those are definable sets. Second part is that there are certain natural maps between those kinds of Hodge spaces, or those, those parameter spaces, those are definable. And the third part is that this period mapping, which comes from, which comes from geometry, that that's definable. And uh, each part of this makes use of different ideas in mathematics. It's, I mean, there's work, there's serious work that's involved, but the work that's involved in the first part is really just analysis, analysis of algebraic groups. Whereas the last part uses some estimates that were proven by Schmidt uh, involving, it goes under the name of the nilpotent orbit theorem. Now, this is where you can make sense of Grothendieck's question. This family of algebraic varieties, you define the Hodge locus inside of this family to that locus where there are more Hodge classes than you expect. And I wrote down a precise, more or less precise sense of what I mean by that. I'm not going to read it. It follows from their work about the definability of all these maps that Hodge locus is algebraic. It's a countable union of algebraic varieties. And the way they prove that is basically by using the definability of the period mapping and the definability of each of these subspaces inside of the periods, the, inside of the targets, inside of the period space, which represents places where, the, where you might be a Hodge class, uh, to see that you get definable sets which are simultaneously, well, sets that are simultaneously definable and complex analytic, hence they have to be algebraic. Okay, so that, that statement was already known uh, 1995 to Katani, Dillon, and Kaplan, but using so long analytic argument, it's kind of a nice thing encapsulates all that. All right, so I see that we're getting on with time. So I'm going to, I think, um, just mention the Axe-Janual theorem that they've proven, but I would like to close with uh, just a note as to what they did with this second half of the theorem, which is really I mean, the, the first one, the one done by, by uh, Backer and Zimmerman. The reason why they wanted to show that these period mappings were, were definable was in order to prove a functional transcendence theorem for period mappings. Now, why do they want to prove that functional transcendence theorem? Now, it's a, of course, it's, a, it's nice to have a theorem, like to know that certain functions are algebraically independent from other functions. That's nice. But what they really wanted it for was to fit into a program by Brian Lawrence and actually Pinkatosh, where they reproved Faulting's theorem about rational points on algebraic curves by making use of Hodge theory, by making use of this, this period mapping. And the functional transcendence theorem that they proved about that definable map, the, the, the definable period mapping is a crucial component in this new proof, new geometric proof, periodic geometric proof of the uh, of all things theorem. All right, so uh, maybe David will ask me to talk 10 years from now and I can, I'm sure that there'll be many, many more applications. Well, if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, <laughs> he could, because there'll be many, many, many applications of this, of this theory to problems in geometry and number theory. Uh, I uh, made a list of these five that, I, I, that I, I think we might see, and you probably won't have to wait those 10 years in order to, in order to see these. I'm sure that this theory has, much further to go with even stronger applications. And uh, I hope that I've convinced you that the tame geometry from, uh, tame geometry from more minimality really does make sense as applications to the Hodge theory. So thank you. Tom, thank you very much. That was a, a beautiful talk and introduction.
Um, it seems that a lot of the effort goes into proving that things are tame. Whereas I guess Grotendieck's hope might have been that you would just start from tame things. I don't know. Do you, do you see that as an opposition? Uh, no, I don't think. I, okay, so I think Grotendieck's hope was that you could axiomatize what you would mean by by uh, a situation being tame. You know, for instance, algebraic geometry, analytic geometry, wh whatever it happens to be, uh, and then you could use that to answer the questions. That you, you could answer whatever questions you might have about the geometry in any interesting context by mm -hmm. uh, by that axiomatic axiomatic framework. Now, so some, something like like Hodge theory, right? Uh, which, on the face of it, uh, should you know, it should have an algebraic origin, right? It's all about it's all about the structure and, and algebraic varieties. It should have an algebraic origin. It should be tame. But the way that you get to it is, I mean, it passes through harmonic forms and everything. It's not you leave the world, you, you leave the tame world in order to in order to start working on it, in order yes. to start working on it. Uh, so you have to do something in order to bring it back, uh, right. back into the world where you can do geometry. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the talk 10 years from now, or five years from now, too. This was very beautiful and uh, very understandable how, how these ideas come about. Uh, there's time for a few questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, Put them in the chat and we will see them and try to take them out. Uh, you, while thinking about that, you have a candidate for the next theorem to fall. What are you working on these days? <laughs> well, actually, I, so this, uh, I was working on the this algebra city problem. There's two parts to it. Uh, one part of it was showing that the that, that the sets are algebraic varieties, but the second part is showing that they're defined over the field of definition of the uh, of the variation. Yes. And yeah, I, I think there are ways of getting at, at that using differential algebra. Yeah. 